Parkinson's disease, and an SCS17 again that can look like Huntington's disease. And so we're seeing that there is now a convergence of understanding of the neurobiology of Huntington's, and Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's, and Lou Gehrig ALS, and the ataxias, a number of neurological degeneration disorders which need to benefit from a concerted effort to understand the kind of systems neurobiology I've talked about, how things are wired up, and also the molecular biology, what happened to the gene level, and can we get in there? This last part is, a, is attacked by a number of folks who work in our institution. There are people who do wonderful work in genetics of ataxias around the country. And all the work I've talked about you'll see in a moment is collaborative. The genetic investigations have been performed a number of places around the country to define these genes. Momentous, important work. We're still trying to figure out how to make that connection from the gene to treatment. How do you translate the gene to treatment? And to do that, you have to understand how the gene does its dirty work. You can't take the gene out, but you can try and understand what's going on when the gene does its work with the proteins that are abnormal and then kills the cells. So what we have is at MGH, Mass General Hospital, is a component of clinical care, a dedication, the mission is for patient care, research and teaching, all of which we do with, with the zest and gusto with a fabulous uh, group of clinicians, uh, teaching our students at Harvard Medical School, working at the Mass General Institute for Neurological Degeneration and Diseases, uh, where there are uh, uh, literally uh, hundreds of folks working in open space in a collaborative manner. The Lakes came to see this in Boston, uh, sharing information, working with drug discovery laboratories to try and take this work into, uh, into treatment, and working also with the most extraordinary group of investigators at the Martino Center and, uh, for Medi Biomedical Imaging, where all of our imaging work has been done with my colleagues that I've mentioned. Uh, the Broad Institute in Boston, where a f fellow who's working with me with cerebellar patients is going to develop stem cells to try and understand the biology of different diseases and then see if we can take a step further to treat people, what we call personalized medicine. Uh, at, at MIT and the Whitehead Institute, there are people here who are working collaboratively with Harvard, with MGH, not in my own group at all at this point, but that's a place that I think we can go. So as we move forward, um, I just need to mention that all of this work is done in a collaborative manner. And none of this happened on my own. Uh, Deepak Pandya in neuroanatomy through the years, uh, fellow uh, investigators in clinical neurology. Uh, Van Wadeen, who, who worked with the uh, uh, diffusion spectrum imaging and invented the technique. Uh, folks in the uh, MRI anatomy section, both in Boston and also uh, in Montreal. People at Boston University have been doing work in monkeys, trying to understand with me what happens if you make a hole in the cerebellum to impair motor control or cognition or both, and people who are doing um, uh, cerebellar stimulation with us to try and improve schizophrenia. And we heard this week that we just got us a very small uh, grant from the National Organization of, of uh, Rare Diseases to look at SCA1 with that technique in the mouse model to try and start to develop what's called a biomarker. How do you know whether a patient is about to have an illness or getting better or getting worse? So these are approaches that we can bring to the, to the field. All in all, what I've described is how we try and grapple with these problems. And we go to work and we get uh, enormous gratification from seeing people trying to help, doing what we can in a caring and compassionate environment. And then we teach our students about what we see and then we have to go a step further. And that going the step further, one can do piecemeal in a, in a collaborative manner but slowly as we've done. But to, really to, to, to make the quantum leap, to do the kind of imaging that we need across populations, to take this work into the laboratory, bring in all the information that we already have with, with uh, sophisticated investigators and eager, uh, bright students. Uh, this takes support. And uh, NIH, as you know, is fabulous, but you get funded on work you did last time, and you have to think about how you're going to go forward the next time, and that's how the system works. So the seed money that people have uh, from patients around the country have uh, have contributed have been enormously helpful, but at no point in my own career have I seen a kind of dedication and a commitment and a gusto uh, that the Lakes have, have shown to try and help to take this to a new level. And so I'll close before I'm taking any questions by thanking you again for coming tonight, for your rapt attention, the quiz I'll do as you walk out the door, <laughs> and thank you.
this slide right here, you were talking about certain strands who are melting away and causing um, Parkinson's disease and, and that kind of thing. And have you isolated which is causing which at this point? So here, the parts that are melting away are parts in the cerebellum that we know when you look under the microscope. If you blow this up, you can see they're crossing fibers in there. Um, this, is, this part is seen in, part in, in, uh, in uh, cerebellum diseases, but it also occurs in uh, some other conditions that are not exclusively uh, confined to cerebellum. What it's doing is it's representing a principle that the brain cells die and their processes melt away as that happens. The same is expected to happen in Parkinson's where you lose the brain cells that produce dopamine. The same is expected to happen in Alzheimer's disease where the part of the, the memory systems down in the inside um, uh, part of the brain uh, melt away, also in the, in the cortex where those cells melt away. There is work going on now in places around the country to start to understand uh, where the first problems ev evolve in those diseases. So it's a way, in a sense, as a, to look at, at a biomarker with imaging to figure out when does the disease start. We don't even know when the diseases start. Did Katie's disease truly start age 19? Did it start when she was five, but she had no clinical symptoms? But if you had a way to look at it, would we have known before? And when we develop the drugs to intervene, which at some day, some point, we will, when do you treat? And who do you treat? And so these are aspects of the approach to the understanding of the patient that makes a big difference. One of the problems we grapple with, and certainly as a neuroanatomist has been a major mm -hmm. issue throughout my entire career, is you know, why are you even doing this? <laughs> like you're looking at brain cells and how they connect up. When we started, what was in vogue at that time was looking at gels and you know, little uh, different kinds of you know, chemical processes and molecular biology. And then lo and behold, you know, Dr. Pandy and I would sit over the microscope saying, you know, people do real science across the corridor. We just are playing over the microscope. Humidity is something I've, I've tried to, to learn from him. I'll never get it quite as, as down as he has, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, and what's happened is that now you can't think about any kind of neurological or psychiatric process without thinking about psychiatry, about thinking about uh, anatomy. So when I lecture to the psychiatrists and I show them these slides and I say, you, you don't glass over. This is your livelihood. You know, pay attention. <laughs> Because in functional imaging and in brain surgery for depression, in brain surgery for obsessive compulsive disorder, where are you going to surgerize? It matters. In the same way, there are ideas, there are pieces of information that come out of the research programs, even at the level of, of fundamental biology, that one cannot accurately predict exactly where they're going to go. But we have a sense that as you increase the knowledge base, uh, so patient by patient will be able to apply that. best culture, of course, being Portuguese, the best society out there, it's the only, uh, the rest of the day, you know. It's um, nice to have an unbiased member of the audience. <laughs> Definitely. You mentioned that another type. Is it very similar to what Katie has in its, um, its impact to Portuguese society? Yes. Okay. So, so Machado Joseph disease is spinal cerebellar ataxia type 3. Katie has spinal cerebellar ataxia type 17. Her disease is exceedingly rare. There may be a hundred or so families in the world who have what Katie has. SCA3 is one of the more common of the ataxic disorders. In fact, the, dif the different ataxic disorders as such a number in the hundreds of thousands in the US. If you add to that, I'll come back to Machado in a moment, but if you add to that, all the other kinds of disorders that we think have a link to cerebellum, including autism and schizophrenia, you're talking very large numbers of people in whom we need to understand the cerebellum better to be able to approach the treatment. Machado Joseph disease, like SCS17, is a problem caused by a stuttering in a gene. And that stuttering can stutter to an enormous amount. And that is related to the age of onset in general and the severity of the disease. It's not a terribly tight association, but in general, there is that association. And uh, that is inherited as a, in a dominant fashion, although many conditions like SCS17 occur completely out of the blue. About 50% of patients have SCS17 occur sporadically, a spontaneous new mutation in that person. The same can happen in SCA3, but not quite as commonly. And it affects cerebellar function. It affects the basal ganglia function. If you get it early on in life, you can look like an early onset Parkinson's. It may affect uh, mental function to some extent. 
It can affect the peripheral nervous system and affect uh, feeling and sensation. So there are